Hello again. Today we're going to do a bit more with physics and we're going to introduce a controller so you can actually influence what's going on in the game world. So the first thing that we left off with is if you run the game you'll see that we have this great little logo box thing but all it does is immediately fall off the screen. So the first thing I want to do is at least put a platform underneath it so that it doesn't uh, just fall away. So if we go to my GDX game, you can see these. here's where we're creating our entities so right now. So we just want to say, let's create another one. Let's say engine.addEntity, entity.apply, and we're not going to do a texture. This one's going to be just invisible. And for transform component, let's just put it at... Uh, zero, well, let's put it at zero, zero, and we're going to create another body, and uh, let's make it, so we can't use, we shouldn't use image, because we're not actually using the image, but let's say uh, for a half width we have ten and one there, so if we hit run, we have our platform, but it's not platforming, it's just falling. Let's make this a little bit wider, and we want to make this a static body. So now you can see it's covering most of the screen most of the width of the screen, and the box is not not going anywhere. So the next thing I'd like to do as a demonstration is make it so that when you click, it generates little boxes, little physics boxes wherever you click. So this involves setting up a controller. Um, and let's see. So Actually, we can just do that right pretty much anywhere, but let's do it right here. Um, there's a global called uh, input processor, and this um, takes the input processor class. And okay, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. There's actually two different ways that you can uh, check to see that you can handle input in your game, and if it's, uh, I think GDX says, libgdx documentation says if it's a sort of a simpler, more arcadey game, um, you can just do polling and uh, you can check to see is key pressed or is key just pressed. And this, you can use these methods inside your render method to check to see if a key was just pressed, obviously. Uh, but they have a slight tendency to miss key presses. And it also, it's very, it doesn't really lend itself to sort of good composable software design. And what, that, what I mean by that is, is if you have a class that's reading is key just pressed, you, you read it and you handle it. But if you, have, if you want to have multiple methods for uh, multiple different classes that are all, all sort of handling key presses in Cascade, um, this doesn't really work, lend itself to that approach. And I'll, I'll show you more what I mean in a, in a moment. So the other way besides check, just calling those methods is you can actually assign an input processor to GDX. And this method, this class has methods that get called whenever a key is pressed, regardless of where you are in the frame. So you can actually uh, be very sure that you're not going to miss any sort of key presses or other events like that. It always calls you. So if you look at input processor, um, input processor is sort of the interface that we that we want, but if you look at how many methods it has, it has a lot of methods that we don't care about. So instead, sorry, that might have too fast. So it has a lot of methods we don't care about. It has touch up, touch down, touch dragged, scrolled, key typed, key up, key down, and uh, and also mouse moved. Um, You'll notice there's no mouse click here or mouse down. 
and touchdown, because LibGDX is designed to be mobile friendly, touchdown means either a tap on a screen or a mouse click. Anyway, so we don't want to implement all of these, we only want to implement some of them. So if you look at the subclasses for input processor, there's actually a class input adapter, and it just returns false for everything, which means you can override just the, just the methods you actually want to. So earlier I mentioned that one of the nice things about the input processor system was that it's very composable. You can use multiple input processors together to handle all the inputs of your program. And the key to that is this class called the input multiplexer. In its constructor, so it's an input processor, and in its constructor it takes multiple other input processors. And the way it works is every time there's a key down or key up or any of these events, it calls the corresponding event on every single processor until one of them returns true. This way you can have, you know, two or three processors and it just, get, just keeps trying them until one of them says, okay, I handled the event. And this is especially important because at some point you might want to use the stage uh, class, which comes from scene2d, and stage is a class for handling various uh, GUI elements, um, user interface stuff. And uh, stage implements input adapter. It extends input adapter. So when you're constructing an, an input multiplexer, you can pass in a stage followed by your own game input processor. And this will trivially allow it to uh, allow the stage to handle all the inputs relating to clicking on the UI, and if you're not clicking on the UI, if you're clicking through to something else, then uh, your game will sort of fall back and pick up those events, um, those click events instead. And this is really handy because it means you don't have to worry about um, events sort of bubbling through into your application when you were, when it was supposed to be caught by something else. So that's why the returning true or returning false is really nice. But again, that doesn't actually do anything unless, um, unless you're using input multiplexer. So instead, if we do input adapter, then we don't actually need to override anything. But that's not actually what we, you know, we, we want to override something. So it, instead of just creating this inline right here, I'm going to go ahead and create another class. I'm going to call it my input adapter. Okay. So let's think about what we want. We want when you click down to place a physics object at that location. So that's going to be touch down. And we can just you know, get rid of the super and just return false. Uh, actually, to return true. It doesn't really matter right now, but true. Because we're handling the event here, we're consuming it, we, we want to return true. So. I'm just going to say, you just have a print statement here to make sure that this works. And we're going to print the coordinates that were, that were pressed. So one thing to notice is, is that these are in screen coordinates because the game doesn't know about your world coordinates. It only, but it, it does know about the screen. So if we run this now, we should get the behavior where if we click anywhere on the screen, it'll print where we clicked on the console, into the console. So if you click on the top left, you get 0, 0, basically. And you click on the bottom right, you get 600, you know, 640 by 480, roughly. And then at the top right, you get 640 by 0, roughly. And over here, you get 0 by 480, roughly. So that seems to be working. And the next question is, okay, if we want to add an entity into the game, 
we need to convert from screen coordinates to world coordinates. And the first way you might be most tempted to do is if you look at our extensions, we have pixels to meters. Uh, we could just take 640 by 480 and divide it by 32 and you'd have your, your pixel location. Um, so this sort of almost works, but it's actually a terrible idea. And the, the reason for that is twofold. Um, one, in our game, in the, in the box 2D world, uh, zero, zero is actually over here in the bottom left corner. But according to our, our click handler, zero, zero is the top, is the top left corner. And so if we divide by 32, we'd also have to subtract the height. And that's not so bad. Um, but at some point, you're going to also want to pan the camera side to side. If you you know, probably, you'll want to move what the camera is centered on. And then you have to offset where the camera is looking at. And maybe the camera will also have a zoom, in which case you also want to handle that. And pretty soon you've re-implemented all of camera outside of camera just to convert your screen coordinates to world coordinates. So <laughs> you don't need to re-implement camera if we already have a camera class. So anyway, so camera has a method that's designed for this. And so if we just inject our camera and uh, camera has a couple methods, um, project and unproject. If you look at project, project is, it takes a vector three in world space and converts it to screen coordinates. And then there's some other irrelevant comments. And unproject converts from screen coordinates to world space. Well, that's exactly what we want. So let's go ahead and um, it, it asks for a vector three. I don't entirely know why, because the screen can only be two dimensional anyway. But um, here goes. So for the vector three, you want you know a screen X, which is a float, and screen Y as a float. And for the Z coordinate, I don't know if it matters, so I'll just specify zero. And now you have your world coordinate. So now you can say Pentlin uh, world x is world.x and world y is world.y. And let's see what happens. Okay, so we have roughly, we're clicking on roughly zero zero on the screen, but for world is roughly zero fourteen, and that's that's what we what we expect. Like, so this is zero zero in the lower left corner here, and this is one one. So if we click right there in the lower left, we get one one eighth comma one eighth, or here is exactly one one, and halfway is uh, you know roughly half. So that's what we want. This is actually, you know, this is perfect. So now all we need to do is do, do something with that information rather than just logging it. We can, let's, let's go about creating this entity. So we already have, well, okay, that's the static body, the, the platform. So we already have one physics entity up here. So let's go ahead and just do the same thing down here. So we need the engine. And we uh, we don't really need the image. I'm just going to go with a just a invisible physics object for now. And uh, so world this name is being uh, overused. So let's say world coordinate or a world position actually. And so it looks like we also need the world. And it's trying to figure out how big to set the box and we haven't given it the image. Let's, uh, let's specify one one. 
and just hard code it. And so the last thing before we kick off is we actually need the position to be um, passed in. So this is a vector 3, and the transform takes a vector 2. So we can just specify vector 2 here, and we say world position at x, world position at y. And you run it. Now if you click, you now get these lovely little boxes. And if you make lots of boxes, they stack and fall and all that fun stuff. Okay, um, well, so next time, uh, rather than just having completely empty boxes, uh, I actually am going to go into how to render the image into these which is actually trickier than you might think because I need to scale it down and rotate it such that it stays perfectly synchronized with the, the physics shape. And rotation isn't something we've really talked about so far.